Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Leviticus, called into the presence of the King, with this sermon entitled, Standing in His Presence. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. On the eighth day Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, but without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And say to the people of Israel, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, without blemish, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings, to sacrifice between the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. And they brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and for the people. And bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them, as the Lord has commanded. So Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver for the sin offering he burned on the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin he burned up with fire outside the camp. Then he killed the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons handed him the blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar. And they handed the burnt offering to him, piece by piece, and the head, and he burned them on the altar. And he washed the entrails and the legs, and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. Then he presented the people's offering, and took the goat of the sin offering that was for the people, and killed it, and offered it as a sin offering, like the first one. And he presented the burnt offering, and offered it according to the rule. And he presented the grain offering, took a handful of it, and burned it on the altar, beside the burnt offering of the morning. Then he killed the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings for the people. And Aaron's son handed him the blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar. But the fat pieces of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail, and that which covers the entrails and the kidneys, and the long lobe of the liver, they put the fat pieces on the breast, and he burned the fat pieces on the altar. But the breast and the right thigh Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord and as Moses commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of, God, the, glory of the Lord appeared to all of the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Um, And so we've been working through Leviticus and we've had a lot of laws, um, a lot of legal kind of things thrown at us, um, the different kinds of, of offerings that were offered and how they were offered. But woven in... All of that legal code um, is a narrative, and we we like narratives, right? That's that's where we have the stories, and we can follow along, and we can kind of visualize what's going on, and that's really what what God wants um, Leviticus to be is this visual illustration for a lot of the the great truths that we find in Scripture. Um, kind of presented to us through the form of uh, rituals and ceremonies uh, that happened in Leviticus. And so, uh, last week we began with um, the ordination of the priests and Aaron being ordained as the, the high priest of Israel. And this week we moved to the inauguration um, ceremony, the uh, first worship service of Israel. I turn my brightness up here a little bit. Um, it's it's kind of handing off of a uh, handing off of the baton uh, because last week uh, we saw Moses doing most of the action. 
Um, he is the one who is, is washing the priest. Uh, he's the one that dressed them in the garments that they would use for service. Uh, he's the one that we see sprinkling various things, the, the altar with the oil, uh, splashing the altar with blood, uh, putting the, the blood mixture of blood and, and oil on the, the priestly garments. Um, but today, uh, after this ordination ceremony, uh, Aaron is going to, to lead a, a worship service. He's going to be doing the action, the officiating on the eighth day. Uh, this is his day one as high priest of, of Israel. And so uh, this is the first or the, the beginning of the daily offerings. And, and so this is going to, to kind of kick everything off, the cycle uh, that God has given it, them, the uh, requirements, the different things that God has, has told them to do. It begins on this day. Uh, and so it's also the, the first celebratory covenantal meal uh, the priests have been presented, they've been purified, and they're, they're ready to serve. And each tribe is, is represented by the, the tribal leaders. And so uh, Moses tells Aaron to, to, to come, and he tells the elders from the different tribes to come. And then he says there's going to be a, a special guest uh, on this day. Uh, twice we are told that God will appear, that the Lord will appear, that Yahweh uh, is going to make an appearance uh, when they go through this ceremony uh, on the eighth day. And so in, in all of this anticipation, as we read this, you, you have to, hopefully you, you're wondering, I, I wonder what that was like, or, or what will it be like when these people are, are finally standing before God? What kind of emotions are they feeling? What kind of thoughts are, are racing through their heads when they hear the announcement that this ceremony is going to take place and that the Lord is going to appear? Is there going to be excitement? Is there, is there joy? Is there relief that, okay, finally we, we get to see God? Is there peace uh, about, okay, uh, we have God among us now, we, we can kind of rest easier? Or is there concern? Um, are they full of anxiety and, and worry? Are, are they afraid? Um, is there a sense of, of kind of dread in them that, that this is God, this is the, the creator of the universe that is going to appear in our midst today? Because if you recall, God's presence is, is something that they are already familiar with, but at a distance. In Exodus, when we talked about Mount Sinai, and where God gives the, the Ten Commandments to Moses in Exodus 20. Um, God's presence is, is on the mountain, and it's described as uh, fire and, and thunder and, and lightning and smoke. And God says, put a boundary uh, around the mountain, Moses, and, and don't let anyone come near the mountain because I'm, I'm on the mountain and it's holy. And if anyone comes close to the mountain and, and touches it, They'll die. So there's this heaviness, there's this seriousness of, of being too close to God. And the people, when Moses comes down from the mountain and gives them the, the Ten Commandments, um, when he tells them that God is, is speaking to them and that he will speak to the people, they say, okay, listen, Moses, um, you go to God for us because we can't even stand to hear him speak. Because uh, if we hear Him, we, it may kill us. It may destroy us even to, to hear God's voice. And so if you remember when we talked uh, a few weeks ago as we kind of introduced the book of Leviticus, um, we talked about God's weight, about His glory and His holiness. And we compared that to the sun. We said, you know, the, the sun is, is beautiful. Um, people take pictures of sunrises and, and sunsets, um, but you, it, it provides warmth. Uh, we enjoy the, the warm days and feeling the, the heat of the sun on our skin. It provides light, um, but it's also dangerous. You, you don't gaze at the sun. You, you don't look directly at it or, or you will 
uh, go blind. It's, it's too powerful. It will burn uh, your retinas. The rays are good, but don't get exposed. Don't be exposed for too long or your, your skin will burn. And so it, we have uh, the sun that is uh, amazing. It's beautiful. It's good, but it's dangerous. And so Moses and Aaron and Israel, they, they recognize this about God, that He is a good God. He's a, he's a good Creator. He blesses. He protects. He provides but he's also dangerous because he's holy. And God will not tolerate sin. He will not tolerate immorality and wickedness and evil. So that's why the focus in Leviticus has been on atonement, uh, which means a, a covering. And so if you stand in the sun for too long, you, you, you have a skin problem. That, that needs to be dealt with. And so we wear those shirts that have the SPF numbers that protect our, our skin or we might put on sunscreen uh, because our, our skin is insufficient. Um, it will get burned and so we cover that up. And in Leviticus, to stand in God's presence, the people have a, a sin problem that must be dealt with. And so we've seen all of these different pictures of of what sin is, that sin is like a, a debt owed for um, offending someone, for defaming or, or disrespecting God in His name. And so we have the, the guilt offering. That sin is like this contaminant. Um, if you think of we had Justin, uh, he loves being outside. And sometimes he, he comes in and he tracks mud in the house or he might step in something that's a little worse than mud and he, he comes in the house and, and may track that in and we're like, you know, we have to make sure we're, we're, our shoes are clean before we, we come in. We don't want to contaminate uh, the house. And so sin is like this contaminant that, that needs to be washed, it needs to be cleaned and, and purified. And then on their own, the people are, are being taught that they are insufficient to, to be able to do this on their own. They have disobeyed God. They've, they've proven that in the wilderness. They've proved that right after receiving the Ten Commandments. They've rebelled. Uh, they have committed treason against the king that is wanting to, to dwell in their midst in this royal tent. Um, and so they rightly deserve exile from his presence. They, they rightly deserve death and judgment. And so their only hope is that something or someone can intervene and, and make things right again. And so what will it be like when they are finally standing before God? When God finally makes an appearance in the midst of their presence? That's not just a question for them here in Leviticus. Guys, that, that's the question that we all individually have to answer. We all need to think about that's a question for us today because we are also warned that we too will stand before God one day. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. As Christians, in our Christian language, we often talk about salvation. We often talk about being saved. And the question is, why do we need to be saved? What do we need to be saved from? And the answer is that we need to be saved from God's judgment. Because each of us will be held accountable for every second of our existence, every moment of our life. One day we will stand before God and be held accountable for that. And there's no secrets before the judge. Every thought, every word, every deed will be exposed. God is holy and only sinless perfection is allowed into His presence. And holiness and His perfection is, is God's standard. That's what is allowed in His presence. And if we could kind of dumb this down a little bit. Um, if you've ever been to Carowinds or to an amusement park, um, you, you, you 
have experienced this, especially if you have kids, but as you wait in line, as you get closer to the line, uh, I think some people are finally figuring out, hey, we should put this at the back of the line so you don't wait in line and figure out you can't ride. But uh, there'll be these signs that say you, you must be this tall to, to ride. That's the standard. You, you can't enter unless you are that tall. That's the height requirement for the ride. And God's standard for being in His presence for being in relationship for him, with Him, for entrance into paradise is perfection. And I'll be the first to admit, I don't meet that standard. And hopefully you're honest enough with yourself to say, you know, I don't meet that either. And so one day we will be judged and we will be weighed, we will be measured and we will be found wanting because we haven't lived our lives according to God's purposes, His design for our life. We have failed to be obedient to our our King. We have all fallen short of God's glory, of His character, of His goodness, and by witness of our own thoughts, our own words, our own actions, uh, we'll, we'll be condemned of treason. And we rightfully deserve to be separated or exiled from God's goodness and God's blessing, to be punished for grievous offenses against an infinite God, and we deserve what the Bible calls hell. And Jesus talks about hell and this punishment for not meeting His standard and for rejecting Jesus as Savior. And the common argument is, isn't that kind of extreme? I mean, do you really believe that? And is all of that really necessary? Do, do you really believe that that's what happens? And the answer is yes, because if, if God did not address evil and sin in the world, then He would not be a just God. Because God, in His holiness, in His justice, He, he can't turn a blind eye to it and ignore that. He can't allow that to continue on. He must act. He must do something about that. And an example in miniature of this is, as parents, um, if you have a, an older rebellious teenager or even a, a, a younger adult that is living under the, the same roof as you, um, if they steal, if they lie, if they are causing harm to someone in the house, causing damage, ruining their own life, or the life of someone in your household, then a parent has the, the right to say, if you're going to live in my house, then you have to live by my rules. And we've heard that, and we're familiar with that. If you are going to benefit from, from my wealth, if you're going to benefit from from my blessings, my provision, my per- protection, my place to, to lay your head at night, then you're going to have to pay attention to, to my standard, my guidelines. You're going to have to, to respect me as the authority in the household. And if you reject those standards, if you reject those guidelines, then you're, you're really rejecting me. You're hostile towards me. You're, you're at ends with me. And if that's where you are, then... You need to to find another place to live. You you can't live here. I I won't tolerate that. And on a a very miniature scale, this is what God is doing on a a cosmic scale. As the creator of the universe, He has given us guidelines. He has given us His standard. And if we aren't going to obey and be obedient, then He has every right to say, then you can't be here. And so God will exile those who don't trust Jesus as their Savior to somewhere else. So that's a small example of what is happening on a a cosmic level. God in His judgment will reject us, not haphazardly, not because He's a grumpy guy, but God in His judgment will reject us because we have first rejected Him. We need to understand that. God doesn't haphazardly or casually send someone to hell. No more than a parent would just say, get out of my house to a child for no reason. But God in His judgment, again, 
will reject us because we have rejected Him. That's why we condemn ourselves. So let me tie that into Leviticus 9 and what we read here this morning because there's a, a bomb uh, that is dropped. In Leviticus 9, the, just the first few verses, you can see it. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. So for the past seven days, uh, Moses has been the one to make offerings for sin, the burnt offering, the fellowship offering to ordain the priest. And here, Aaron's first task as high priest is to own up to his own sinfulness, to own up to his own rebellion against God and his rejection of God. Last week, we, we talked about how the, the priest isn't perfect, and so their sin has to be uh, atoned for. Their sin has to be dealt with. And when we looked at the sin offerings, uh, if you recall, any time a, a priest sinned, he was to offer a, a bull to make things right. But here there is another word in there that is a hyperlink. Uh, that makes a, a very personal connection to Aaron as he serves as high priest. The specific requirement of a bull calf for Aaron's sin offering. Imagine Aaron's reaction to those instructions. Aaron, God is going to appear today. We need to, to prepare these offerings to, to make an offering for God to God. And your offering, for your sin offering, I want you to bring uh, an offering for yourself, for your own sin. And your sin offering needs to be a, a bull. And by the way, Aaron, your, your, your bull, it needs to be a calf. And Aaron's head would hang low as he remembers something. It's not the first time that Aaron has priested over a calf. He remembers his guilt involving a calf. In Exodus 32, God had given the people the Ten Commandments in, in Exodus 20. And so this narrative kind of happens in between those chapters. And the people uh, agree to obey God. They say, yes, yes, God, we, we will have no other gods before you. You are the only God that we will serve. We, we won't fashion idols to try to represent you or fashion idols of other gods. You are going to be our God and we are going to be your people so they enter into covenant with, with God as king. Yes, you're king. They sign it in blood and Moses sprinkles blood on the people and Moses goes back to Mount Sinai for 40 days because if the king is going to live among his people, then he has to have the palace tent and that's when the, the instructions for the tabernacle are, are given to Moses for how to build the tabernacle. And as Moses comes back down the mountain, something is, is going on because while he was away, the people turned to Aaron and said, Hey, Aaron, Moses ha has been gone for a, a little while. Um, we're kind of nervous. We don't know what happened. And, you know, Aaron, we, we really want a God that will go before us. We're ready to move on from here. We've been camped here for a while. We're ready to move, and we need a God. So, Aaron, here is some, some gold. Will you make a God for us? And just sign the covenant. No other gods, no, no idols. And Aaron crafts this golden calf and facilitates and, and leads them in worship. So Aaron hears this, and God is saying, listen, Aaron, this is what these sacrifices are about. These are, this is what these offerings are about. It's not about food and, and trying to, to feed God because God doesn't eat. It's not about offering enough blood and, and killing enough animals to show our devotion to God and try to appease this angry God. This blood accomplishes something. It covers Sin, it's objective. It serves a real purpose. It's to cleanse you from sin. It clears your account of the debt that you owe me. It purifies you from the, the contaminated soul that you have. God does not 
ignore and overlook sin. And Aaron, you must not overlook sin either. Salvation, forgiveness, restoration, it costs something, Aaron. And you deserve death. And and let me remind you of that because I, I want you to bring a bull calf that represents the sin of you making the the golden calf, of your idolatry, your rejection of my command and me as God. That's what you deserve. You deserve death. But a substitute is going to die in your place. And again, we we see, and and I hope as I've I've repeated these things, I I really do hope they're sticking in. And and that's why I use kind of phrases and and say them repeatedly because I I want them to, to seep in. And this one is, God is again providing what God requires. God provided what God required. And so in this inaugural service, God is reminding the people that these offerings are personal. Aaron's own sin, his own thoughts, his own words, his own deeds, his own sinfulness must be dealt with. And so God says, for yourself, Bring a, a bull calf. And then he calls the elders together from each of the tribes to represent each tribe corporately. But the picture again is, is personal. You're going to lay your hand on this animal because it's going to be designated to die in your place. You deserve death, but God has provided atonement. God has provided salvation through its blood. God's judgment is satisfied because a substitute has died in your place. It's a gift of God received by faith. It's trusting that God has provided what God requires. So the good news is that what God has provided is is sufficient. And at the end, we read that God does show up as a consuming fire. I, I think we... Take for granted the significance of this. That God does show up as a consuming fire, but He doesn't consume a sinful people. The fire is not directed towards a sinful people, but it is directed, the fire, the wrath of God is directed towards the substitute that has been provided on the altar. Guys, that's significant. That cannot be overstated. His judgment and His wrath consume the sacrifice, the substitute. And Jesus is our substitute who took the wrath of God, the judgment of God, as He hung and died on the cross. Again, God does not overlook sin. He can't. He doesn't ignore it. It must be dealt with. And on the cross we see God's love and God's wrath. God's justice and God's mercy. And Jesus dies, God in flesh, God incarnate, so we might live. He dies as our substitute. For God so loved the world that He sent His only Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. As He he died for everyone. Anyone can come, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. But here's the thing. We have to call. We have to call. It's a personal decision, and each of us must receive it by faith. Each of us must trust in what God has done through Jesus by faith. And we often use the ABCs to talk about salvation, about receiving Jesus as our Savior and it's, it's not complicated. It, it's simple, but it, it's, it's personal. First, the A, admitting that we need a Savior. Admitting that we have sinned and that we have wronged, offended a holy God. That we have not always been obedient. That we have not always loved God like we should. That we have not always loved our neighbor as ourself. Admitting that we are in need of a Savior. That if we stood before a holy God that we would stand guilty. 
that we need to be forgiven. Second is the be believing, trusting that Jesus died, that his blood was shed so we could be forgiven, and that if we ask to be forgiven, God is faithful. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then finally, the, the C, we can look at that as either confess or, or choose. We confess Jesus that what he said, that what he modeled carries weight in our life. That we are, are following him because his, his word and his actions carry weight in our life. That he is our king, that he is Lord or we could look at that as choosing, that we are, are choosing to follow Him because He is our authority. So we confess that uh, He is King, that He is Lord, and we confess that we have fellowship with Him. That now we can come to the table. Now we can be uh, are in a relationship with Him, that we are, are friends with God. We're no longer hostile to God. And then we follow that if you want to take the alphabet further um, with a D and we demonstrate that by baptism. And I, I say this when we have had baptisms, but guys, baptism does not save you. Baptism is a public de declaration that you have been saved, that you are dead and buried with Christ and raised again to new life by the power of His resurrection. That you are following him, that you have placed your faith in him. And then we can go even one letter further. And we can say, okay, A, B, C, D, E. After that, we, we evangelize. We, we share the good news. We go and, and make disciples. We see all of those things in Leviticus 9. The sin offering is offered first, and Aaron has to admit that he's a sinner. And I'll just throw this in there. He's already been ordained as a priest, right? And so he, he could have a, a kind of high opinion of himself or think, I, I don't need that. But the second he's told that a holy God is going to stand before him, all of that is backseat. We've got to make this right. Because every one of us is going to stand before God and he, he, he cares about you, but what you do as an occupation, how educated you are, how much money you have, it's not going to carry any weight. He's going to say to Jesus, do you know them? Do they know you? The burnt offering after the sin offering is offered. And we also call that the, the whole offering. So the sin has been atoned for and, and now this burnt offering is, is laid down. The complete animal is laid down and we talked about the picture of, of Jesus and how he is the vicarious substitute for our sin. But the way this works is there's also another way we can look at that. And since our sin has been atoned for, since we are in fellowship with the king, the only appropriate response is, God, here I am. Take all of me. I lay my life down to you. It's yours. I surrender to your authority. I surrender to you being king over my life. And then finally, the peace offering that is this meal that demonstrates again that you're no longer enemies with God, but now you can sit at the table that there's fellowship, that there's a relationship. And Paul will use this same language in the New Testament to kind of connect all these pieces together if, if they're still fuzzy. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, through 11, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you have been washed, you were sanctified, and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Do you see that? You are washed, you're cleansed, your sin has been washed away. You, you've been atoned for by Jesus. You are sanctified, you're, you're devoted, you're set apart. You're, you're, you're called holy in God's sight. 
And you are justified. You're, you're, you're just. You're right with God. You're not enemies with God. You're, you're just. Things are good with God. Paul uses that same language. Paul says this is who you were. He lists all of these different kind of sins that condemn us. And this is not an exhaustive list. He's just giving some examples of sins that condemn us. And Paul says that's not your identity anymore. Because you're a Christian. You're a Christ follower. You've put your faith in Christ and are following Him. You've been washed by His blood, sanctified and justified. Leviticus gives us picture after picture of these rituals. It reveals that we have a, a sin problem. That's our problem, guys. That we have offended God that, and then we have a, a debt that we can't pay on our own. We have a contamination that we can't wash away on our own. And God has provided life through the blood. And all of this in the Old Testament points to what Jesus will do in the New Testament as He serves as both our high priest to make atonement for us and the sacrifice that is offered and we're cleansed by His blood. you guys care if I take a little bit more time? Is that okay? Can I get all of the, the younger kids to come up here on this pew? I didn't get to do this in our rally this morning. If you guys will sit down on that pew, I'm going to sit on the steps. But I can't escape the thought of, of doing this this morning. I think it's something that God has impressed on my heart. So I'm going to, to do it now. So I, I brought something with me this morning. And I wrapped it up because... This is, this is very precious. I have to be careful. It's very precious. Luke, do you know what that is? It's an egg. So, you see the egg? Can you feel it? Feel the egg? What's that egg like? Huh? What's it like? It looks, I don't know. What color is it? Black. It's white. White, yeah. Is, is that soft or hard? It's hard. It's hard, right? Yeah. See, it's, it's an egg. It's, it's very precious. And this egg is, is like everyone in this room. We're very precious to God. But see, something stands in the way. Between us and God. And so there's this, if we think of this like our heart, our heart is, is hard towards God a lot of times. And then we have this thing called sin. Do you, you guys know what sin is? Can, can you tell me a sin? Stealing? That's, that's, that's a good answer. Lying? What else? Okay, murder. Yeah. Anybody else? Have you ever been really angry with someone and said some words that were hurtful? Uh, so some some you said some bad words or hurtful words. Maybe not listening to parents. Yeah. Hurting people's feelings. Yeah. Breaking somebody's toys. Good job. Not breaking the toys, but good answers. <laughs> yeah. So, God, what's what's happened to the egg now? Yeah, but it, it's not white anymore, right? It's dirty, right? And so, our our sin, it 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 makes us dirty, and that's what we've been talking about in Leviticus, right? That, that sin contaminates and it, it just makes us unclean and it, it needs to be dealt with, right? And so 
how, how can we deal with that? Can the egg do anything about that? It needs, needs somebody else, right? To do something. Yeah. And so if, if we've done something bad, if we've hurt somebody's feelings, and, and all sin hurts God's feelings. It hurts Him. And that's what we, we have to understand. It, it hurts other people too, but it, all sin is against God. And so we've done something wrong. And so we need forgiveness, right? And so Jesus came and he, he died for our sins so we could be forgiven. And he, he wants to lead us in a new life. But all, and all we have to do is, is believe in what Jesus has done for us. And trust Him enough, trust Him so much that we actually ask Him to forgive us for our sin and say, God, I'm sorry, and I I want to follow You. And I I give my life to You. And do you know what God does? And we we talked about that. That's admitting that, hey, I've, I've messed up, I've sinned, believing in what Jesus has done for us, and then choosing to to follow Him. We just talked about that, right? And do you know what God does? All of that sin. He removes it. He takes it away. Because Jesus' blood covers our sin. He washes us and makes us clean. You know what else he does? Luke, you said that was a hard egg, right? Touch that now. What happened? It's soft. It's soft. And when we... we Trust in Jesus and follow Him. God gives us a new heart. He gives us a clean heart and a heart that's soft so we can hear Him and follow Him. And that's what salvation is. And when we talk about that, that's what we're, we're talking about. And so you guys think about that. And think about, is that something that, that I need to do? And you guys think about that too. Because it's very important. And it's not hard. But we all have to do it. It's, it's very personal. But God loves you. And He wants you to, to know Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. For what You teach us. For what You show us. And God, we thank You for... Jesus, who came and entered into our world and was perfect and obedient and who gave his life so that we could be forgiven, so that we could know you and and have eternal life. Thank you for that. Help us to share that hope with others, that news with others, because it is good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a good week.